Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is the September 2021 edition of the Montessori Show. I am Jeanne-Marie Pinel, live from San Diego, and I am with my dear friend Simone, who is in her classroom today. Pretty Hi, amazing. everyone. Nice to see you. Yeah, I'm calling in from Amsterdam, and it's always a pleasure to be with you. And I think that Zoom automatically turned your cameras off, but we would love to see your beautiful faces. Um, so turn them on so that we can connect with you, at least visually. And um, as we're a small group today, there are opportunities to ask questions. You'll be able to either unmute yourself or pop your questions in the chat. And today, the focus is all about Montessori activities. We haven't done one in a long time, and this is um, topic that always comes up, but if you also have other questions, I think we'll have space to probably answer some of those towards the end of the call as well. So thank you all for joining us. And Jean-Marie, how was your summer? My summer was amazing. I actually completely unplugged and I was with family. We did a big trip with 23 family members and it was amazing and I got to be with my father who is aging he'll be 89 next week so that was very special for me to be able to be there for him and tend to him and and all of that so lovely summer thank you and you yeah, I had a very low key summer. I didn't get very much further than the Dutch borders. I went for a couple of <laughs> holidays, uh, one week in Friesland, if anyone knows Holland, and one week near Deventer. And uh, I spent as much time as I possible with my university aged children who were coming in and out of Amsterdam. So that was my main priorities was to hang out with them a lot before they went back and were on campus. And I only now see them once every two weeks. So yeah. I'm at the other end of the four planes with you, Jean-Marie, with our kids yes, getting a little yes. older. And yeah. um, whenever they're home, your heart just feels so full, right? It does. I have my my son that's home this weekend and it's it's delightful because yeah, we don't see them as much. So it's it's wonderful. And and actually this summer was pretty special because it was the first time in three years that we were back as a family unit because with my daughter living in Scotland and, and all the travel restrictions and all that. Um, so it was pretty special. We, we got to spend some very good quality time all together. So yes. Um, now, do drop, drop in the chat where you're calling in from, turn on your camera so we can see your lovely faces. And um, it's very special today because usually I'm at home for these calls, but I was down near my classroom and I thought it would be really fun to call in um, from my classroom so that you can see. And if we have any questions about actual Montessori activities, um, I'll be able to maybe carry my laptop around and show you. Pascal, thank you for turning on your camera. Lovely to see you. Welcome, welcome. Where are you calling in from? I'm in uh, New Caledonia, so I'm waking up. <laughs> oh my goodness wow already on yeah. saturday morning that's amazing uh, Thank it's you. five in the morning so that's why it's dark mm. so are you we'll a montessori educator uh yes i am uh i'm usually from i'm i live in canada quebec canada and i'm here since uh, may mid-may till mid-december to teach to do a maternity leave and uh train Three to six. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. And yeah. that must be such a beautiful area of the world. It is. It is so beautiful. Yeah. And they were they were COVID free till okay. two weeks ago. Oh. And now we're on lockdown. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. life. It's okay. They had to experience it to to understand the whole world. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Hello, Tahura. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name properly, but welcome. Where are you calling in from? Hello, uh, Hello. I'm calling in from India. It's 11.30 p.m. right now, so we're going to sleep. <laughs> okay, so a little show before going to bed. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> we're really excited that you can be here. And we've actually had some questions come in before the show about Montessori activities. Um, I always love to say that Montessori activities, um, you know, a Montessori shelf is not the be all and end all, but it is where we see such beautiful concentration, where we see what a child is working to master, where we see an amazing amount of how capable they are. You know, when we set them up with intention, exactly what they're working to master, 
and in an attractive way. So that's our intention for today is how we can make uh, monster activities at home or if you're working in the classroom we'd love to hear your experiences as well um, and it's just a really cozy place where we hang out every few months um, to answer your questions. So Jean-Marie should we get stuck into some of the first questions do you think? Sure 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 so um, let's see the first question comes to us uh, from a parent of a nine-month-old let me just open this up so I can see the name um, Marina uh, no uh, Inas, Enas, do you give pre, uh, presentations for nine month old babies or let them figure things out alone? And I think that is a very good question because we do set up the environment from the time of birth, but how, how does this whole idea of presenting uh, go forth? So Simone, I'd love if you could expand on that. Absolutely. Um, I love this question because like the way that we set up the environment is so that it's attractive and engaging and we're observing them and adjusting. Um, and so when I finished my Montessori training, I was like armed with all these beautiful presentations and I went up to a child and said, oh, look, and I was so excited to show them how I could do all these presentations and what I thought they needed to know. And then I realized that's actually really not Montessori. That's still top down. You know, I'm still got an idea of what they need to master right now. And so over the years that I've been working in Montessori, in different classrooms, I'm in my own class, I actually give very few presentations and step in when they need a little bit of assistance. And particularly with babies, they're doing a lot of exploration. And then when they make the discovery that the ball falls through the hole and comes out by itself, it's like magic. Um, so I do do uh, less presentations. One thing about baby like how we put a baby activity out on the shelf is that I don't actually use a tray because that actually almost gets in the way of them pulling something off a shelf. So that's quite different to um, how we do it in a toddler classroom, where it's really handy for them to have everything at the ready and they can carry it, you know, to the, um, the table, the table then marks their work area, and then they bring it back and that then marks in the beginning, middle and end. Um, and baby activities usually have like one step. So um, that's mostly how I do it. If they're frustrated and they're really trying, then I might say, oh, look, and then like John Marie always says, show the acronym slow hands emit words, um, then I'll just really slow down my movements and show them how it might work if they're frustrated. Do they need a little bit of help? But um, there's a quote that we included in the Montessori Baby from Nicole Holtfluer, who's a friend of ours from Radical Beginnings. And she wrote, the struggle is essential because babies are making those sounds. And it's so hard to hear as an adult, a parent, a caregiver, when they're going, ah, ah, ah. And you're like, oh, I just want to give them the toy that they're trying to reach right now. Oh, I just want to, you know, flip them over faster, you know, so that they're not in any, um, you know, pain. But actually, sometimes it's just observing. Are they in pain? Are they, you know, actually suffering right now? Or is it actually them attempting? And if they can actually then grasp onto the thing that they're trying to work towards, then that's the satisfaction of mastery. Um, so actually, I'll show you a puzzle here. Um, this has been in my classroom for many years and once I was doing a parent education evening and um, someone um, knocked it over and I made a joke saying, um, oh, don't worry, I can put that back together with my eyes closed because I've done it so many times. And the, par uh, the parent who was there said, oh, I'd like to see that. So I said, you really want me to just do this with my eyes closed? So I did it, but there was one piece at the very end that I couldn't get in. I couldn't work out why it wouldn't go in. And if you see, there's two sides. When you've got your eyes closed, you can't see that it's upside down. I couldn't work out why it wasn't fitting into the spot. And then when I finally realized, oh, I need to flip it over, and I put it in, I thought, oh, that's what the mastery feels like for the young child when they're doing it with their eyes open. And it was such a blessing to have that experience to really remember what it feels like um, when you complete a puzzle. Because, um, yeah, this also leads into what's a Montessori activity and what's, you know, an open-ended activity. Why do we have, maybe Jean Marie, you'd like to talk about it, why we have, you know, a beginning, middle and end in our monster activities, but there's also a place at home, of course, for open-ended activities. Well, the, the, the notion with, with activities is just kind of this um, uh, progression in, in, in difficulties, right? We, we, we want to build upon, uh, uh, about, uh, upon mastery and, and difficulties. So that's often why we have different kind of sequence to, to the same activity. Because, you know, a puzzle like what Simone just showed us, she could very well just put two of the shapes 
out, right? It doesn't like, it, it would be overwhelming for the first time to see all of those pieces and, and try to figure out. Um, but I did want to, to just follow up on something when you said the, the, about the, the struggle, I was actually on a call, um, yesterday with, uh, the author of all the positive discipline books, uh, Jane Nelson, and she just, reminded us how important it is for us to allow our children to struggle, to not like intentionally want them to struggle, but to, to leave them in that, in that energy of trying to figure things out for themselves, because that is when they figure out how capable they are. And this starts, this starts, you know, as a, as a newborn when they're trying to move or slither somewhere and it goes on till, you know, my, my 20 year old these days or, or whatever it's, it's through life that we learn through, through our struggles. So I like that you, that you shared that quote. Beautiful. Also, um, I think this is a good place to discuss the idea that as Montessori educators and adults and caregivers that we, um, remove obstacles for the children. So as much as possible, we're trying to make our environments accessible to them. We're looking for clothing for a baby, which they can move, you know, rather than a dress where the baby's trying to crawl and they're getting their knees stuck and all those kind of things, we're removing the obstacles. And yet, I also think they need to have some obstacles to master. You know, if you make it too easy, there's no challenge. And then you'll find that they challenge us. So I think that's also just a fun thing to think about. Like, where are the obstacles? can I remove as much as possible the obstacles so they can be successful, but not so many obstacles removed that they're not challenged by the situation. True, true. No, very true. And it's when I, and I think when we say removing obstacles, it's, it's about that preparation of the environment so that it is prepared for their size, their, their, you know, where they are in their development. Uh, but we don't, we don't, you know, bubble wrap everything. We let them, uh, we, yeah, we, we let them in, in a little bit in their struggle, but very ponder on that question. How, how, how much is too much of removing obstacles? I like that. <laughs> Wonderful. Like, um, you know, also life in the real world, we speak to our children in such a respectful way. And then what happens when they come up against an edu like a Montessori teacher, who's not like maybe the way that we would expect a Montessori teacher to talk. Um, and I actually don't think it's such a bad thing, like to, for a child to maybe feel disappointed or to not be totally accepted. You know, that's also real life and, um, how we hold space for that, not trying to rush in and fix it. Um, a lot of people who've come to my classes, they, um, you know, I've cared for them. I've given them a lot of guidance and then they get to a three to six classroom and they all of a sudden lose contact with the the teachers so much because the child's meant to go in by themselves. Um, they might only have a couple of parent teacher conferences a year and they struggle a little bit with like feeling a little bit left out. And when something comes up, like they feel like their child's being a little bit bullied or um, something hasn't gone right. They want to go immediately and have a meeting with the teacher. And um, I, my first advice is how can you actually empower your child to actually take this as like a learning experience and express that, something's not going the way that they would like and how can they solve the problem themselves and if they need to go in and see the teacher that they actually take the child with them and involve them in that process rather than the adult going into you know continually fix and I think that's a more Montessori way of you know like I've heard that some parents turn up at job interviews like why didn't you give my kid the job and it's a bit like that you know we're training them that we're going to come in and fix their problems. Well, it's that whole, you know, it's that whole rescuing and, and, and pampering and doing things for them, which, which is not, you know, doing them service at all, because like you say, in the real world, they won't be able to figure it out uh, for themselves. So, so true. And it starts and, and it's hard for, for, for parents, you know, especially parents of little ones. We don't, you know, we don't necessarily want to watch our child struggle and such, but if you can remember just for yourself, like that's when you learned to do something is, is through the, the trying and the, the, you know, failing and trying again and, and doing it. And that's when you have that satisfaction of, yes, I am capable. And so children need that to, to grow and, and feel confident. So, so true. Cool. Yeah. So, um, so I have uh, another question here from Marina. 
And uh, so principles Montessori activity, how they're applied in daily life. Despite having studied in Montessori school till the age of 11, life as a mother has been much different than I envisioned for myself, partner and son, three and a half year old. Uh, my small family has gotten into a bad habit of long stretches of screen time three plus hours when we're at home, mainly at the end of the day and rainy weekends, which is often. As soon as my son has the opportunity, he grabs the phone to watch cartoon or play video games and less and less he's interested in anything else I suggest to him. It has become easier for me to simplify, find something else for me to do. Result, each one of us in a different room, most often in front of a screen. I'd love to discover activities that a three-year-old, the three of us could do together at the end of the day to unwind or even separate activities we could enjoy in the same room. Do you have suggestions for activities or from where to start when you need to break a strong unwanted habit? Many thanks. So that is a loaded question. Um, that's a loaded question. I, if, do you want to start on that one, Simone? Yeah, I think it's a great question because what it I is, just it is because it's really been a tough period and people have had to do work and other things and the screen has been involved. And so like that you're recognizing that that's a problem. Sometimes it needs to go cold turkey where you just don't have screen at yes. all. It's really hard to have this middle ground of like going back to like a 10 minute thing or something like that. So to reset, sometimes it just, it's going to be a little bit cold turkey that you might just want to have screens off. I know some people like Mighty Mother, um, Eloise, she mm -hmm. does have screen time for her child, but they know that it's at five o'clock and that it's always the same. And they have a very select number of programs that they're allowed to choose from, ones that she is okay with. And that's part of their ritual. And so it could, rather than them nagging all day, they go, oh, our screen time's at five o'clock. And then it's very clear because what adds up is like all the little times you're sitting at the cafe, you just want a little bit of peace and you pass them the phone. And then like the phone's lying around the house and they pick up the phone and then all of a sudden they're playing again. And so I, first of all, say is like, if you don't want them to touch a phone or you don't want them to turn on a television, have all the remote controls and all of the devices out of sight. Like if you're leaving an iPad on the coffee table, it's going to be the easiest thing to pick up because this is just entertainment. I don't have to think to do that. Um, and then I would look at making a really engaging play space. So when they walk in, they see exactly what there is. So I was really lucky to do a makeover for a family in New York when I was over there two years ago on the Montessori toddler tour. And um, we, I walked into their house and they had a lovely area to play, but you couldn't see what was available. She said, particularly her six-year-old came home and just kind of flopped on the couch and said, I'm bored. I don't know what to do. And you couldn't see and what there was to play with. And like, I opened up their cupboard and I pulled everything out. I wanted to see what they had. And there were beautiful wooden toys there. There was like great craft materials, but none of this was available, easily accessible. It was all kind of packed in. So what we did was we set out and made some age appropriate, um, engaging things. I asked what the child's interests were um, and we made some really cozy things. And she said, I'm not sure my daughter's gonna like this at all because like, yeah, I'm not sure. And then the feedback was like, instead of being upset about how we've changed everything in the room, all they could talk about was how fun it was that like they were cutting scissors and then they were gluing those down. And then there was a butterfly activity that they were like looking up in a book. You know, it was like, everyone worries that their child's gonna miss the thing before, but they're actually just so engaged in beautifully prepared things that are gonna engage them. So I think that I would look at what makes my three and a half year old interested in. So I have um, a child this week who I discovered loves maps. And so he was, um, using this pegboard, I'll go and get it because it's fun. I love that. I love that Simone is in her classroom because then she can really do show and tell. It's wonderful. Oh, no, no, it's <laughs> he, he said, this is our house. This is the supermarket and this is grandma's house. You know, this is a three and a half year old. So it's showing how it's such a different brain to an under three year old child. You know, this is quite an abstract concept. And so I was talking, he was there with his nanny and we were saying how, you know, maybe later they could actually draw a physical map of the places that they're going to go later. And then he didn't want to leave class at the end. And so I said, oh, I think that, you know, Amina was telling me that you're going to go to the supermarket, you're going to go home and you're going to go to grandma's house. And so we kind of used the same process. He went, oh yeah, we are. And so again, using his interest in, 
maps, it was like that I could communicate, engage him in something that was going to happen anyway. Um, so it's always like looking at what is super interesting. I've had a three and a half year old who's also into bell towers. And so they go around the city looking for bell towers and traveling to places where they can climb up and see the different size bells and the tones that they make. And then, you know, you can imagine all the music. Um, if you've got a child who's really interested in vehicles, then there's art and craft things you can do. You can make a washi tape kind of um, road that they can work on. They could do paintings or stamps. I've got some really nice um, stamps with different vehicles on them for some self-expression. Um, you could um, go to the fire station. I actually even heard they've got an what do they call it, an ambulance shed? And that's where the ambulances in Amsterdam go to sleep, well, sleep, you know? And I just thought that would be that. So apparently one of the families, they go past there as often as they can because their son loves ambulances. Um, I've got puzzles that have vehicles on them. So that gets them interested in some fine motor things around um, vehicles. There's pretty much like any activity you can create. In, like, you know, it, we're basically Montessori is holistic education. So we're looking at how can I, engage some fine motor skills? How can I engage some self-expression? How can I do language? Like the books that I have um, with all of the names of the vehicles and what they do um, are so popular in my class. And then I have other ones that are like long stories with sounds and, and they love that as well. Um, anyway, I think, I'm, is that enough? That's plenty. And I think just to go back to the question, I think also Marina was was really asking for support around how to how to break a habit that has been going on. So for 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 me, it's really look at your habit first, right? Look at how you can can put that phone away or or you know your screen distraction at that time of the day when you're all together. And, and start really being, being aware of it and, 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 and start doing it just on your own so that you can then start modeling that. And, and for me, the activities that the three of you could do to unwind could very well be, um, you know, starting to prepare food together, uh, coming together in the kitchen. Wow, what are we going to make and, and, and making it together? Uh, putting on some music and, and getting our wiggles out and, and dancing, going on a walk, uh, exploring, getting some fresh air so that you're, you're kind of breaking the routine and, and starting to, to do things away. And, you know, for me, I really like the idea of cold turkey, like cold turkey, meaning you just stop from one day to the other, the, everything disappears. Uh, there, there is no options for, for phones and screens. But that is hard. So that's why I want you to work on, on you first uh, and then and then start applying that. And the other thought that I had was maybe, uh, you know, before you go clean in, in your home, maybe if you can get away for a weekend and go to a lodge where there is no technology and you don't take technology with you and you experience something completely different which I think will help your son be aware of how amazing life is without a screen. So uh, there are some different ideas and I hope that is um, helpful. Also board games, they're starting to get into board games. Yes. And taking them. So memory games, um, I really like shopping list is a really easy, fun one. And orchard where they you each get a basket and you're putting the fruit in. That was something we love to do. And around food preparation, like baking is so much fun with a three and a half year old to lay out all the ingredients ready to go. And then they start to add the ingredients and then they'll, it won't be long before they're measuring the ingredients on a simple scale and like testing the, those kind of things. So I love doing baking projects. If you want to do family things together. Yeah. Thank you for reminding so, me. This. So we have some uh, questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. And uh, one is how do you see Montessori at home and homeschooling for working parents? Uh, I have an 18 month old child and I'm working to full time uh, office. How and when can I practice Montessori at home and is homeschooling meant for me? So for me, that's that's a question that you need to have a good conversation with yourself, Anita, about is homeschooling for me? Uh, you know, I'll be perfectly honest. I considered homeschooling many times because I 
saw my children uh, struggling in school and, and it just, it wasn't something that I felt I could do. Um, even though I was working in a classroom with other people's children, but for some reason, homeschooling kind of scared me. So I think it does take a special, you know, personality. So, you know, be, be honest with yourself uh, because it is almost a full-time job. And then um, for me, you know, Montessori at home with you there, it's really about setting up the environment so that your child can be doing activities while you're doing your activities. But Simone, you probably have a lot more to add on that. Yeah, I don't even call it homeschooling with an 18 month old, you know, right, definitely right. It's education from birth, which is learning to be in our daily life. And but also, like we talked about the holistic education and seeing that we can meet their gross motor needs, their fine motor skills, their self expression, um, through preparation, all the practical life activities and language um, is a huge part, of course. Um, so but I would say that an 18 month old is like a full-time job and you've got your work, which is a full-time job. So that you're doing that alone and that may be COVID related or not, you know, hats off because I was like homeschooling, I guess, two young children. Oliver was 16 months old and Emma was a new baby um, and I was at home. And I took that as my full-time job for those first three years before I went back to work. So um, I think it takes a lot of coordination. And if you have anyone who can, a partner or another person who can, one of you, kind of is on um, on toddler duty while the other one's working. So it means like, okay, what have you come, got coming up today? What have I got coming up today? Am I going to get a babysitter to come in for those hours when I'm in a meeting? Because it's actually really hard to Montessori to, to keep a toddler entertained for an hour while you're on a phone call. Like they, they can play for short periods of time um, and where you stepping in to help a little bit and then you're stepping back again um, when it runs most smoothly but what you, you you can be very creative if you really have a nine to five job and there's no other possibility then I would look at yeah like John Marie was saying like I'm going to prepare my meals together with them so that we're going to have cooking time at the end of the day and we're going to do bedtime in a Montessori way um, which just means that it's a fixed routine so the toddler knows what's coming next in the routine um, and the rhythm of the day um, that, you know, I might take a snack time break and then we can prepare snacks together, um, that they have a Montessori shelf with activities that they're interested in, that they explore while I'm on my calls. Um, but I think what worked best in COVID times was with the families who went, okay, between seven and seven, I'm just on kid duty. And before seven, I might get some work done. After seven, I might get some work done. And that is all I can do right now because to do both is really like, I salute you. <laughs> um, so we have another question and we have a question actually from Erica who is here. So if you wanna unmute yourself, Erica, and just ask it, cause it is a wonderful question. Hi, um, yes, I, I again, I'm, I'm just trying to follow my child um, and he is obsessed with his chainsaw um, cause we've had a lot of trees cut. It was an abandoned lot basically. Um, and he was gifted this chainsaw. And, um, and now that he's seen the gardeners with ear defenders, he's found some old headphones of my husband and he's appropriated those. And the two have not gone apart. And I feel a little bit sometimes like, can you pick a different activity? Or is it, or, or I'm, I'm also trying to embrace it. So I went to the library today going, do you have any books on chainsaws? You know, like uh, just, trying to to make something of it but I, I, a part of me is like oh go for it if that's your thing and, and you're exploring the garden and cutting cutting things and um that's great and another part of me feels a little bit like am I being um too lax and I, should I be I don't know encouraging him to do different things I I'm torn <laughs> So wonderful, what, wonderful question. And, and I think it's one that many parents ask themselves and even teachers, because I remember, you know, having some children in my classroom who were obsessed with, with a certain, you know, type of activity. And I wondered, like, am I supposed to guide them to somewhere else? And I was actually told by my mentor at the time that no, you, you, this is what they need to go through until they feel satisfied 
and they've mastered. So for me with your son, it, it sounds like this is really what he's enjoying right now and getting great satisfaction. You could definitely bring in the names of the trees, uh, the different shapes of the leaves, you know, things that are around all of that activity or maybe have some other tools also of, you know, putting nails in a, in a tree stump, things like that. But it sounds like he really wants to be outdoors doing big work. So this is also, you know, part of that development. So maybe it's, it's carrying, you know, the, the, the pieces of wood that are laying around and making a pile somewhere, things like that, where, where it's, it's going to, to satisfy uh, that need. Simone, okay. you want to add to that? Yeah, I love that idea because I was thinking I would be using that interest to you know, go into language like Jean-Marie was saying. So I have in my class tubes, T-O-O-B-S makes like a really lovely set of different um, tools. So I have the saw and the hammer and then I made matching cards and you can have exactly the ones where you take a photo or a Polaroid. So they match the 2D picture to a 3D object and then you can have other types of hammers and have pictures of a hammer. And then they're starting to extrapolate, extrapolate exactly what the hammer's for. And so I would expand into hammers and building and construction and, you know, go down that path as well. And like Jean-Marie was saying, movement, because you can actually just start to move logs from one wheelbarrow to another place or a wheelbarrow, you know, it's anything to do with tools. And um, I like just not what's a book on chainsaws, but a book on trees, a book on tools, a book on tools through history, you know, like it could go like a far on, way. On the, on the different jobs that use the earmuffs, for example, right? There, there's plenty. So it, it's like, for me, it just, you can expand so much from that very specific interest right now, because all he did was he observed other people doing this and it was fascinating. So sometimes, I mean, I remember with my children, we just would go and find a construction site and just watch it because it's fascinating, right? There's, there's big machinery in there and they're doing things. So do be be okay with following your child. He's he's doing he's doing something good, right? It's it's he's 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 interested in something and he's he's mastering a skill that he he needs to do right now. So yeah. Yes. So we have another question here um, from somebody that is on the show. Hello, Marike. If you are here and want to unmute yourself and uh, be here, you can. Um, otherwise, oh, here she comes. Hello. Go Hi. ahead. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, so um, I'm, I'm pregnant with my baby girl number two. And so my first one is just, um, she will be three by the time when my baby uh, will be born by the end of January. And I was wondering if there is a Montessori way of preparing her for the new baby. So I, I have read um, happy, uh, Peaceful Parents, Happy Siblings, which I find totally convincing and helpful. I also read the, the book before that. And I was wondering if this is in line with Montessori or if there's something that you would be doing differently, or I, I, I will try to make it as smooth as I can, but of course it will be a big change for everyone. I also have to, change the environment we will be sharing a room all of us together it will be very different and i'm i'm wondering how much can i engage her with it without it being overloading you know i don't want it to be the overarching topic no matter what we are doing but she should still feel quite engaged so i'm yeah i i was just wondering if you have any tips or advice or anything that I can do. So, so a wonderful question. And I would, you know, for me, it's about being honest and truthful and, and what's, what's happening. I don't necessarily, you know, would want to do it so far ahead, but definitely involve her and, and explain that we, we need to make a little bit of space for her baby sister and, you know, get some books maybe about becoming an older sister. There's wonderful stories. And when you mention it also, there is a, um, a website called Montessori in Real Life, uh, Teresa, 
And she actually had uh, a wonderful kind of blog post about how she prepared her daughter to, to have her sibling and just some activities that they actually did, like washing the baby or putting diapers on the doll, things like that, so that it was kind of this practical life of, of you know, getting ready for it. And for me, it's really about involving them, especially when baby you know, is there is like, oh, it looks like, you know, your your baby sister is hungry. Let's, uh, you know, can you get me the burp cloth or I need to, you know, whether you're breastfeeding or bottle feeding or maybe we need to change your bather so so that you're really um, involving her. And at the same time, acknowledge if she gets like she's not interested and she'd rather do her own thing that that's OK, too right? Like we can't, we can't impose this on them. There's some that that are going to be, you know, no, I'm not ready for this. And, and, and we need to give them time. Um, you know, I, my daughter was four when she had her baby brother and completely embraced it and, and was my little mother helper, you know, from day one. But not everybody is, is, is going to be that way. So, you know, really acknowledge her feelings. And if she gets jealous and all this and, you know, say, I understand. Um, I know this is, this is hard. So um, Simone, please add to this. Yeah, I agree with it being a long time, but I also know that a lot of the babies are coming with us, um, the toddlers come with us to the appointments and things like that. So again, giving them as much information as they need, what's going on with the ultrasound. Also, if I'm feeling tired, I'm feeling tired today, I have less energy. Um, my children, as I mentioned, are quite close together. So Oliver was having to walk at a very young age. So we just like spent a lot of time going very slowly because I wasn't able to pick him up and carry him. Um, as we were making that transition, but yeah, books and everything like that was a great way to get started with that conversation. And obviously my belly was growing. And um, what I love about is including the older sibling already talking to the belly and having their hand on the belly so that they see, like you can start observation from in utero and it reminds us to slow down. And like, how does the baby respond when you put your hand on? How does the baby respond when the older sibling puts their hand on what about if you know there's a father or another partner when they put their hand on and different family members so that it's kind of a fun like little way to get them involved um if they have books they can read to the baby if they have music they like to play they can play that and the reason i mentioned those three things is that when the baby is born then it's a way a point of reference that will be actually really secure and make the baby feel like they're part of this family and they talk about the first six to eight weeks um, as a period of symbiosis and that's when you're getting in a symbiotic relationship when the baby's getting to know you and the family and the family are getting to know the new baby so those can be really beautiful transition moments also to have a topachino have you heard of that it's like a quilt a blanket that's quite small and the baby's placed on that and that's actually really lovely particularly when an older sibling's holding them and they um, then have a little buffer between them it's not so stimulating it's a bit more gentle for the baby and then also if the baby falls to sleep it's a nice um it's easier to kind of put them down without the startle reflex so a topachino i think would be really great with an older sibling um also junifer uzudike who i wrote the Montessori baby with she has three children and when her youngest was born um in when the baby cried she just said, oh, the baby's crying. And instead of her saying, oh, I've got to go and get the baby, she'd say, who'd like to go and check on the baby and actually involved them, not giving them too much responsibility, like you're the old one, you have to do it. But if they'd like to, it kind of makes them feel like, oh yes, I'm very important. I'm going to go and check on the baby. And they, I thought that was so beautiful because so often we're leaving the toddler to go to fetch the baby. And what if the toddler actually it was their job to go and check the baby first? I just thought that was like a really lovely thing. Um, as it gets closer and depending on the age of the older sibling, I also love, we mentioned Jane Nelson a couple of times already from Positive Discipline. Um, and she has a really beautiful um, ritual, which is with candles. Jean-Marie, do you know this one? Yeah. So I, yeah. I do know, I do know it, but, but explain it. It's beautiful. Okay. Yes. Okay. So say that like, Marika, are you married? Have you got a partner? Have you got a papa or mama involved? What's your family yeah. Yes, yes, I'm married. And I also, it's in the book, I know the candle thing, but please tell it because it's beautiful. 
mama and papa in this family just for the same, but it could be a mama and mama or papa, papa, whatever. So then you have, um, this is me, this is mama. And when I met papa, I shared my, like, you light the candle, this is a candle. This is a candle, this is the candle, you need four candles in this family. Um, this is, I, I like this one. So I had all my love. And then when I met your papa, and then you light this candle with this one, I shared my love with him. And then this baby was born. This is you, I don't know your eldest child's name. And we shared our love with them. And now the three of us have the love. For it. And now the new baby's coming and then you light the fourth candle. And then you have these four candles that are lit. And it shows that like no one misses out on the love. The love just keeps growing as the family grows. So I don't know, uh, I hope that kind of, I don't know, I must be honest, I don't know peaceful parents, happy siblings, um, that book to say if it's Montessori or not, I would say that it's all aligned with these kind of principles. Yes, yeah. And um, I do like the Siblings Without Rivalry book from Faber and Maslich. I think that that's a really lovely one too, because it talks about not putting children into roles, um, how we un we don't mean to compare children but we kind of end up saying things like oh eat peas like you don't like can you eat some peas like your brother is eating and I'm like it just really reminds them like oh he got more pancakes than me and that you actually rather than taking sides you just focus on the individual ah look we're talking about you and how you're going to become a big sibling <laughs> how there's the older that? sister <laughs> wonderful I hope that's helpful Marika yeah, thank you. Very helpful. Thank you very much. And then I just had one thing to add. I don't know in what stage of pregnancy you are and where you are. Are you in, in living in Europe or in the States? In Germany. In Germany. Look up uh, aptonomy. Aptonomy is something that um, is practiced uh, through, I think, osteopaths in, in Europe. And it is really the the science of, of touch and, and how to, to really communicate with the unborn child uh, when they're in utero. And it is just really beautiful. And that would probably also um, help, you know, all three of you have that connection uh, before the birth. So autonomy. Uh, we have another question actually from Pascal, who is right here with us on the call. Um, Pascal, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Yes, uh, I have a question because in my classroom, I have this uh, young boy who's interested in nothing. Uh, we suggest things and he's just interested in nothing. And I find that he's not alone. Uh, I find that these days it's, uh, maybe it's me, uh, the children are more um, passive than engaged in their activities and uh, daily life. So I was wondering if you have any trick of the trade that I can work with with uh, this little boy. Simone, do you want to do you want to answer that? I have some questions. I have some ideas that came, but I'll let you start. Sure. I think it's a beautiful question because um, I would love to. Okay. Sometimes I don't know if it's a new child in the class or if they've been in the classroom already since they were three. No, he's a new boy. Yeah, and so um, the not getting engaged in anything. I, as uncomfortable as it is to let them observe the class, I would keep <laughs> observing and then. Also just looking out for any spark. I remember, I can't even remember now which, it, I've listened to so many Montessori conferences and things over the last year and a half. So I'm <laughs> pouring a blank on where I heard this in the last year and a half. But they were talking about this child who was not engaging in anything in the classroom. And then one day after all of this observation, the child mentioned that they were then interested in maybe shells. I can't remember the exact thing. And then from this interest in shells, they just went deep diving into this big enormous shell project. and kind of like they got books out of their library all about the shells and then just their child was just from that moment on engaged so it's kind of like getting to know the child a bit like symbiotic symbiotic period it's like I don't know anything about this child I'm going to keep observing to see how they move um what kind of things like I also sometimes think that we come with a little bit of prejudice in our minds these children have got too much screen so then they're more passive and that's actually what we end up getting back is that these children aren't but if we um, engage them with interest and wonder in the world, 
they just can't help but be sucked into it eventually, you know? So keep showing wonder for out in the garden. Maybe they're not as engaged in the classroom, but maybe outdoors is their thing, you know? Um, if they're, I also love having an old and another child, you know, to maybe be the one that might be able to show them around each day um, and see if there's any little twinklings of friendship. Um, is that, are they observing the same people? Where do they choose to sit? Um, is there anything we can do to make them feel more comfortable in the space? Have a meeting with the parents to find out what their interests are at home. Um, I'm sure you've done all, the, you, you may have done all those things already, but they're the things that come to my mind first. Thanks. Yeah, and, and I will add, you know, what Simone says about being okay with him just observing, like that's, yeah. that's that he learns so much from, from observing the other ones. And then the other thing is to me is, is sometimes to ask for his help. Like, I, I really need your help, you know, to either go, you know, put the dishes in the dishwasher or, or get something from the garden or, or help a younger child or something. Like I know when I was in the classroom, those children who maybe had a harder time choosing work for themselves, sometimes when they were helping me, then it was kind of uh, natural that they would go off and, and do their own thing. Um, and then, and then if you do have an outdoor environment, like letting them do something outdoor that is maybe more manual, um, you know, I, I know I remember actually a, a boy that was maybe a, a tiny bit uh, older, but just did not was not engaged in anything in the classroom and then one day there there happened to actually you know Erica to Erica's point there was a tree that had been taken down so there were all these logs and all I did was do you think you could move the the pile of log from this side to the other side and he happily did this very kind of you know manual labor that was physical but after, you know, a couple of days of that, he was just so ready to be in the classroom and choose more kind of, you know, focused work and all of that. So sometimes they just need more physical work at first. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that because uh, I propose things and it's always, no, I don't feel like it. No, I don't feel like it. No, I don't feel like it. And I'm like, <laughs> right. And do you, you ever like and do you ever ask him like what do you feel like? What would, what nothing. Would, nothing. Okay. And that's okay. And you can say, and that's okay. Nothing is good. Okay. Nothing okay. is good. You know, you can watch the other children do, and when you're ready, there's plenty of things. And if you, you know, if you want me to show you something, I'm right here for you. Like, you know, I think when we take the pressure off, it 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 will also um help them and take the pressure off yourself too yeah, as, that's as, what i was saying you know take thinking that I have. Both sides. Yeah. yeah exactly thank you thank you're you you're very welcome yes you dropped a name uh, a book in the chat do you know this one um children who are not yet peaceful oh by donna, yes. by donna gertz um she's a it's an amazing book about children who are a little actually disruptive in the classroom but the same yes. principle would apply to a child who's not engaging into the community how you make them part of the community um so i think that would also be really relevant for a five-year-old she gives a lot of examples of that kind of age group. yes yes um so we have some questions that came in before and i know that there's another one um that is here in the chat. I'm just going to go real quick back to the ones that came in earlier. Uh, what can I do when I'm trying to observe my children and they just want me to play with them? They are two and four year olds. Thank you. That is a perfect question because I think it's so common, right? So common. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is um, just to tell them what you're writing. Like, oh, I'm writing that John is putting the cars in the row and Peter is drawing on the paper. And when they know that I'm writing about them, then they sometimes feel engaged. So that would be like my first point of call. Sometimes they want to take my notebook off and say, oh, it looks like you want to write too. And then I get them a notebook and a pen and they can just sit next to me and write because that's also like um, fine. Um, also, it might be like, is there, are you having connection first because without connection you get very little cooperation so if you've just sat down but you've kind of asked them to get dressed 
um, eat breakfast, do all these kind of demands. And then you sit back and you haven't had moments to like, let's, I would first like read books and get cozy and then kind of extract myself because um, that's when I find that children kind of can play more independently when they have a full tank of love and connection. And yeah, we have children, like I love Montessori, but I also think we have children to play with and have fun with. And um, so it's not only that children have to play by themselves. So I'm also observing on the go when I'm preparing food with them. I might not always have my notebook out. Today, um, this week in class, I've been doing um, an observation exercise with families. And sometimes they get intimidated by having the whole notebook. So I've just made a game called Spot the Difference. And I just said, like, put on Montessori goggles and so you're going to look at your child objectively with more detail and as if you've never seen them before because they're going to be different than they were yesterday. So I want you to spot the difference, what maybe in the areas of fine motor or gross motor or language or social development do you see differently than you've never seen before. And it just made them more focused on staying in the present moment looking to the child to see what they're interested in, what they're telling us about themselves um, instead of us. When we spend a lot of time with our children, we forget to see with new eyes all the time. So it could just be that you play spot the difference. That, that and I think it's also, um, you know, that is part of the observation that they want to play with you, right? Uh, so, so like Simone is saying is to, to be able to observe on the go while you are playing with them, kind of make some mental notes that you can jot down afterwards and also, uh, observe you, right. Observe yourself as to, you know, is it bothering you that you, you, you need to play or you should play or, or things like that, that, that is part, I think of this observation, at least in our home, is to, to observe the, the adult in the environment as well. So hopefully that helps. Um, next one is what are things that you can teach your toddler and baby to get more along with? I'm not sure I understand the question from Patricia. But- You might uh, like how to get them to play, like to cooperate, to play with each other, to get along. I don't know, but, um, <laughs> that but uh, Simone, if it's, if it's, if it's activities, uh, Simone has a wonderful download of, of all sorts of activities that can be done for toddlers and babies. And then in both her books, um, the Montessori baby and the Montessori toddler is wonderful with lots of activities there. So if Patricia, if you're on the call, I don't think you are. But anyways, so we have one from Shi, Shi Ming. I do hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And she cannot unmute herself because it's 4.30 in the morning in Melbourne. So wonderful. Thank you for being on the call. Wow. We thought Pascal had gotten up early, but, you know, this one beats, <laughs> this one beats it. So um, uh, she's listening to us from under the covers. Well, <laughs> Good snuggles. So are play schemas Montessori and do we have to look out for them through observation and create activities to support the schema outside of shelf work? Asking from a young toddler point of view, nine months. Also on the topic of off shelf play, what is a good balance of introducing new activities for young toddlers so that it isn't overwhelming a new activity a day, question mark, for example, introducing discovery baskets with different things. Can I change up the content every day once I find that the item has been explored thoroughly or do I leave it for them to come back to it? So there's several questions in there. Uh, first, Simone, what do you say about um, the play schemas? And, so, and I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that properly, but. Right, yeah. yeah. So schema play, <laughs> schema play is really interesting because I think it complements, but it's not part of our Montessori training at all. Um, and I think that it helps some people observe because they're kind of like, I don't know what I'm meant to be observing, but when I see them in the transfer of schema, then I see that they're moving objects from one to the other. And in Montessori, we just write, I see the child picking up the block and they're moving it into this basket so for some parents or educators or adults or caregivers they find it a useful way to observe um, I personally have never used them um, because I just really like to not get complicated over complicate things really but if I see an interest then I'll follow that so um, I think then 
you, you could put an activity on the shelf that you see supports that schema or that supports that interest. I think they're almost saying the same thing, except that they have these classified schema plays. Um, oops, the question just moved up. What about you, Jean-Marie? Do you know much about schemas? Um, I don't. I, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. I don't. And it, it's it like you say, it's not part of our Montessori training. I do see, you know, sometimes these trends on on Instagram of, of families kind of sharing uh, what they're in. But to me, that's all just part of observation. So when you see your child interested in opening and closing things, then that's what you're going to put on the shelf, right? Or if you, um, you know, like Erica sees her son being interested in, in going out and cutting branches, well, we're going to follow the child and we're going to try to expand from there. Um, so, so to me, that's, you know, like you say, it's really part of, of the observation. Um, so, so I hope that answers your question. Now, the other thing about um, shelf play, what is a good balance of introducing uh, new activities for young to toddlers that isn't overwhelming? So for me, and, and Simone will, will say a lot more on this, but for me, it's really, again, observation. If the child is going back to that activity and interested and discovering new things, because every day they see it for, for, for the first time again, right? So as long as they are engaged in it, I would not take it off the shelf. Like it's really, for me, you know, this whole shelf rotation thing, it's not on a schedule, you know, every three days I have to change activities. It's about following the child. If the child is interested in an activity for, for 10 days, then it's going to stay on the shelf for 10 days, right? Um, yes, you might want to change, you know, one object in, in the basket, you know, if, if, you want, but it's not like you don't have to, is what I'm, I'm trying to say. So really observation. And Simone, please, please actually, expand on that. Yeah. With a nine month old baby, I, they actually don't get bored of things as fast as us. We get, what I notice in my classroom is like in a baby class is that the adults, particularly when you see it with a baby who can't crawl yet, the, the mother or the carer or the father are picking them up and moving them around very fast. And you're like, okay, observe the child and actually you need to observe even closer to see when they're getting bored actually if they're still lying and they're engaged and they're looking at something and they're not squealing or fussing then it's okay and I notice that I get bored that I'm like oh I just want them to master that or um, I don't want yeah I don't want them to struggle um, so it's observing ourselves a lot um, is it our need to change it or the baby's need so I really love that Jean-Marie pointed out that's based on observation um, and then I'll be honest I was a parent with two young children and I just went Tuesday's the day I'm going to rotate some toys because otherwise I'll forget to do it at all based on what I've seen this week and so you can also, you have to go with real life as well, which is like, sometimes I'm not the perfect Montessori parent in that I remember like that I'm going to want to change every moment that I see a new interest develop. So keeping it real as well. Yes, wonderful. Um, so we have one more question and, and questions have been closed. Um, and this, this has been wonderful. Thank you all for, for joining us. All wonderful questions that, that I'm happy we can be here to support you. So wonderful. So we have Carmen. Carmen, hello. And I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and, and come on screen. Um, if I remember correctly, Carmen is in Dubai. Uh, but, uh, so I don't know, Carmen anyways. So, okay. I'll read the question. Um, my child is four years old. This is his second year in kindergarten. He was in a group where there were 10 children from three to five year olds with one teacher and one teacher assistant this year, his teacher has changed and the teacher is, just, is still there. These are just five children remaining from last year. And I think these are six new. He keeps telling that he doesn't want to go to school in the morning and he tells me the same thing. There's Carmen. Do you wanna, do you wanna uh, ask you a question quickly? Like just the, the, the question itself, um, because we are, we are kind, kind of coming up on our hour. The thing is, how can we encourage him to like the school or to be more comfortable in the school? I, we don't know. 
Okay. So you think there there's been some new changes and he's, he's feeling unsure about going. Um, for mm -hmm. me, it would be, it would be, you know, on a daily really asking him fun questions of, you know, did somebody make you laugh? Did you help somebody? Um, you know, things about really engaging him. And, and also, you know, check with the, with the teachers, like how is he doing in the, in the classroom itself? Because children from, from experience, uh, children tend to make us feel bad for dropping them off at school. And once they're there and in the classroom, they are engaged, they forget about us and they're, they're happy as can be, right? I saw it from the, the teacher perspective where, where children were giving kind of their, their parents, you know, no, I don't want to go. And then the minute they were in and had their hands on activity, they were, you know, happy as can be. In so, case it is it is yeah. more like uh, he is more quiet and relaxed when he arrives at uh, the class. He's not like moving all around or and not none of these things. He is like sitting and looking around and see and, and telling what is going on, what is going to today or whatever. So he is more like relaxed. No, it is not like he is super happy after I go. It is more like he he needs time to settle as soon as he arrives to any place, and even if he's with us. Yeah, and that's fine. He's, he's, he's a little introvert that needs to take his time to, to get adjusted. He's, you know, like the, the child we were talking about with Pascal of just being okay with, with observing and, and, and that's fine, right? If he just needs time because it's a new, a new teacher, new friends, he just needs to take his time and, and, I think we just need to, to respect that. Um, you know, it's true in the morning hearing him say, I don't want to go. That's always hard for us to hear. So, you know, maybe if we know some of the things that he did the day before or, in a, you know, so if he did an activity is reminding him, oh, but you get to, you know, you get to work with the puzzle map again or you can finish, you know, what you're doing. So it, that's why you know, being involved in knowing what's going on will also help you kind of get him excited about finishing uh, the rest of the project. And Simone, do you have something to add here for a five-year-old who's maybe a little reluctant to go off every morning? I think I feel for them because, yeah, you were saying as well in the chat that the PCR tests and they have to do that. And that is going to be uncomfortable and something that they're not going to do. So you can kind of empathize like, yeah, it's so uncomfortable. Does it feel really uncomfortable? You really don't like doing it. You wish you didn't have to do it. Yeah. <sighs> Every 30 days, huh? That feels like a lot. And, you know, just really sitting with empathy in those moments and yet, and we're going to do it a bit like teeth brushing and they may not be super happy about it and it's going to happen. Like, would you, and you said that they do it themselves. So, you know, that's also great. Um, if there's a way like that they can feel more comfortable in the class, like it, I, I think my children love taking a plant into the classroom, um, bringing books to, that we could contribute to the class as gifts, um, making them really feel like this is their space. Um, and also just, I think they say, I don't want to go. And we start to try and cheer them up and tell them all the good things that are going to happen today. Instead of just say, yeah, some days you don't feel like going. And some days you just really love it. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Do you need an extra hug? Should we do some extra hugs today? Yeah. And I'm yeah. going to pick you up. Oh, I'm going to squeeze you as we're going towards the bike, the car, wherever you're going. It's just like a different way than trying to just brush on the carpet and make them happy all the time. It's like, I'm really happy with kids being uncomfortable with stuff and I'm still going to make them go to school. Right, right. My own to add. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. The whole, the whole acknowledging that, yeah, it's, it's hard and, and, and we still get to do it is, <laughs> yeah, with love. With love. <laughs> I How hope that helps, Carmen. Okay. Great. And it's already the time has flown by. Yes. And I just, we, we, there was one question from an anonymous about uh, speaking Norwegian in English at home that we did not get to because we wanted to focus on, on our theme, this uh, show on activities, but do go back to on YouTube, look up the Montessori show. And there was actually a show that we did all on uh, bilingualism 
and uh, you, you can find a lot of information there. And I know also Simone on her website actually has a course on uh, bilingualism as well. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, so all of the things we've mentioned, we'll put the links into the show notes, which will get emailed to you after the show. Um, so I'll include those links to Ewen Chrisfield's workshop, who's an amazing bilingual specialist, um, and yeah, lots of other links as well. And Jean-Marie, tell us about your parenting school that's going to be opening up again soon. So yes, before, before we began, I was telling uh, Simone that I've decided this year to really simplify and just focus on this one uh, course that I really love and that I'm passionate about that's called the parenting school so you we'll put the link in the show notes as well but it's it's basically and you can get on the wait list it will probably open in a couple of weeks and it is a five module where I go into Montessori positive discipline and I'm there with you uh, mentoring you and and answering your questions so that's the parenting school that I'm looking forward to and then uh <laughs> Way and then and both Simone and I are in the uh, the Montessori Homeschool Summit that actually starts Monday. The tickets are on sale now. I think it's sixty eight dollars if I if I'm uh, correct. I I I miss misspoke earlier. I thought it was free and it's not free. It's <laughs> but it's wonderful. It's it twenty five plus uh, speakers all about uh, Montessori and and homeschooling. And you have a uh, year long uh, access to all the videos and, and such. And I think there's a Facebook group too, where we will be discussing uh, all the videos. So that is the Montessori Homeschool Summit. We'll put that link in as well. And then Simone, you have something special going on these days. Yeah, news for me is that I'm very happy being back in my classroom. We're all back together with 12 adults and 12 children and making snack. And it feels like, and this is good while it lasts. I don't know, but it feels yeah. really amazing. And then on Monday, I kick off with a two-week boot camp to help folks around the world to set up their own play groups where you work with the adults and the children. Um, I run two-hour classes. I've been doing it for more than 12 years. And I just, I couldn't stop. I thought the pandemic might mean I have to close down this classroom, but I'm just so happy to be back doing this work. It brings the yeah, I'll put a link to the in the show notes as well if anyone's interested in starting their own. I yeah, I can't. It's honestly the best way to work as a Montessori educator, um, and share the Montessori love because um, it makes it very accessible. You know, Montessori is known for being expensive and all those kind of things, but even if they don't go into Montessori school, they have this foundation where they'll be able to apply the principles in their daily life. So yeah. thank you everyone for all the kind comments in the chat. Um, Sarah said this was so wonderful. Thank you. And Carmen was saying your parenting school was amazing and still giving you lots of tools to work with the kids. <laughs> Money, thanks a lot. Um, and thank you very much. Oh, I and she just ordered Tompincino. Wonderful. That's going to be perfect for your, for your older child. That's wonderful. Great. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Thank you all for being here. It's always a delight to see how international this community is and, and just um, you're all wonderful parents and educators. So thank you for, for showing up and thank you for doing the work that you're doing. So, and thank you, Simone. It's always a delight to share this time with you. Uh, likewise, I'm so happy that we get to do the Montessori show because it's always a good reason to see Jean-Marie's beautiful face. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you're welcome to unmute yourself to say goodbye. Thank you all for joining us. See you soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.